This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 46 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, November 14th, 1908. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. So the first section of the paper in, on November 14th was the About Town section. Mrs. Anna Wentworth, widow of A.J. Wentworth, died at the home of her son, George A. Wentworth, at the Edwin Haywood Place, Chamberlain Road, Sunday evening, aged 79 years. The funeral was from her home Wednesday afternoon. Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey of the Unitarian Church, who had a personal acquaintance with the family, officiated, and appropriate selections were sung by Mrs. Grieg, John Grieg, and Mrs. Osgood. The remains were taken to Malden on Thursday morning for burial. Miss Bertha Prescott, after a few years of observing and studious attention to duty and discipline, has been awarded a diploma from Grace Hospital, Boston, as a properly qualified nurse. Westford Grange invited at its last meeting to visit Chelmsford Grange Thursday evening, November 19th. This is an individual wisdom affair and is quietly correct in its etiquette, but the Grange has an organization doth not, quote, let its right hand know what its left hand doeth, end quote, as it relates to this visit. Sounds like they aren't telling uh, Chelmsford that they're coming. The Taylor Woodlot on the northerly slope of Tadmuck Hill, which is the hill that uh, supports Westford Center, and recently bought by William P. Proctor of Dunstable is being cut off and teamed to North Chelmsford, a distance of five miles. William E. Wright has the contract for teaming, and W. N. Millis is assisting. Now, ladies and gentlemen, is a last opportunity to take a green look at the northerly green slope of Mount Tadmuck, for soon the century green of this landscape will be merged into the sawdust of civilization. Oh, for Roosevelt to preserve it. Uh, it, it was said uh, of Roosevelt, this, this is Theodore Roosevelt he's referring to here, who was a conservationist. It was said of him in his uh, Wikipedia article, quote, of all his ac achievements, he was proudest of his work in the conservation of natural resources and extending federal protection to land and wildlife. The next section is the Westford Center section. Mr. and Mrs. J. Henry Colburn have moved this week into the tenement over the store owned by Mr. Seavey. I believe this is the store that was located just east of the J.V. Fletcher Library and across Main Street from Town Hall. The A.H. Sutherlands also moved this week into their recently purchased home, made vacant by the Colburns, while John Good and family will move into the house made vacant by the Sutherlands. The house occupied by the Goods and known as the True A. Bean Place, which is the home that still stands at 14 Depot Street, was sold by auction recently and bought by Horace Gould, the purchase price being $700. Can you imagine getting a house for $700 in Westford today? Mr. and Mrs. Elliot F. Humiston are to occupy Mr. and Mrs. Goods' house for the winter months during their absence in New York. The Goods left last week. That's good with an E, G-O-O-D-E. Charles O. Prescott and Reverend Charles P. Marshall have been attending the sessions of the Massachusetts Civil League in Boston this week. Selectman Edward M. Abbott is enjoying one of his yearly trips to Maine. Mrs. F.C. Wright was returning from her regular trip to Lowell Tuesday about 5.30 when, about opposite Alec Fisher's, a Bio J. Abbott's carriage came in the opposite direction, and one of the spirited horses took fright and got too close to Mrs. Wright's team. About this time, the 530 electric car came along, which is the trolley, which added to the confusion, although it did no real harm. The result of the excitement proved to be a broken whiffle tree on the Abbott carriage and a damaged harness to the Wright outfit. Also, a sense of gratitude by all concerned that no more serious damage was done. A, a whiffle tree on, on a wagon 
uh, or carriage is the pivoted swinging bar to which the traces of a horse harness are fashioned and by which the carriage or other vehicle is, dr is drawn by the animal. A successful food fair was conducted at Mrs. John B. Fletcher's pleasant home by the ladies of the Congregational Church last week Friday afternoon. As usual, the good home cooked food found ready sale and about $15 were realized and a social time enjoyed by those present. About a dozen patrons from Westford Grange attended the session of the Middlesex North Pomona last week Friday at Lowell, remaining in the evening to witness the beautiful fifth degree of Pomona conferred on a class of 85 candidates. The Pomona Grange was kind of a countywide uh, Grange, at least it encompassed uh, a, a significant number of other of towns that worked together. The next section is just called Club. Owing to some being busy with preparations for the Unitarian Fair, the attendance was not so large as usual at the session of the Tadmuck Club in Library Hall Tuesday afternoon. Those who were present enjoyed an afternoon well worthwhile, it being the first of a series of three during the season on foreign, on foreign travel. Reverend Winfred Jesney Rhodes, pastor of the Elliott Congregational Church of Roxbury, was the speaker of the afternoon and gave a most interesting and luminous account of a trip through Brittany in France this last summer. The lecture was characterized with much literary merit, fluently describing these quaint and simple people, their folklore and traditions, their costumes, and their picturesque festivals. He told of what Brittany and her people have contributed to literature and graphically described her beautiful cathedrals. At the close, Mr. Rhodes was given a rising vote of thanks for his delightful lecture. I believe uh, they use the term a rising vote of thanks fairly often in the wardsman, and I believe that is what we would call a standing ovation. Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey supplemented the afternoon the afternoon's program with a character sketch choosing for his subject his Greek professor at Harvard College. Perce professor Sophocles was a unique character and was delineated in Mr. Bailey's happiest reminiscent vein. Uh, the references to uh, Evangelinus Apostolides Sophocles, who was born in 1807 and died in 1883, he was born in Sangarananda near Mount Pelion in Thessaly, Greece, and studied at the convent of the Greek church on Mount Sinai before coming to the U.S. in 1829 under the patronage of the American Board of Commissioners of Foreign Missions. He studied at Amherst, taught for a few years, and in 1840 came to Harvard as a tutor. He received A.M. degrees from Yale in 1837 and Harvard in 1847 and an LLD degree from Western Reserve in 1862 and from Harvard in 1868. He became an assistant professor at Harvard in 1849 and 18, 1860 was appointed to the chair of ancient, modern, and Byzantine Greek, which he held until his death, and he published a number of Greek textbooks. Reverend uh, Benjamin Bailey received his B.A. from Harvard in 1854, so uh, as indicated, he was, uh, would have certainly known and was taught by Professor Sophocles. The next meeting, uh, November 24th, will be a real roundtable discussion in charge of Miss Loker with the following topics resolved, that our club will be more successful if we place less dependence on outside talent, and resolved that a high school training is of supreme value to the average child. A full attendance and a willing interchange of ideas is earnestly expected of the membership. And the next section is the Westford Grange. The last meeting of the Grange was well attended and was a good session, being true to its primary purposes and discussed in good, sensible debate the following subject, quote, farm life, which are greater, its pleasures and profits or its hardships and disappointments, end quote. The brothers had the monopoly of the subject and the sisters listened with interest while Samuel L. Taylor, Frank C. Wright, and Edson G. Boynton, and Leonard W. Wheeler had their respective turns at it. 
Many ideas were brought out and different ones, but with all a note of refreshing optimism, believing that the compensations of farm life were fully equal to other callings if an equal amount of grit and determination were put into it. The discussion was preceded by music by the Grange Orchestra. At the business session, considerable time was necessarily consumed voting for the class of candidates soon to be admitted. The Grange voted to change the next meeting from Thursday, November 19th to Wednesday, November 18th, that the members might be able to attend Chelmsford Grange and witness its degree work. Fraternal visitations between these nearby Granges have been difficult owing to meeting on the same night, and for once it was voted to change our own session. The next section is the Forge Village section. The ladies' sewing circle served a baked bean supper and held a harvest style last Saturday evening, which was well patronized. After supper, there was dancing and a social evening was enjoyed by all. The few vegetables that were left were sold at auction, causing a good deal of merriment. The ladies of the sewing circle are agitating the subject of putting the town water into the mission house for it is needed very much and would greatly facilitate the labor of those who get up the entertainments at the hall. Miss Sarah Precious and Harry Brown furnish the music for the evening. This, that paragraph was all in reference to what we call or refer to as a St. Andrew's Mission uh, on Pleasant Street in um, Forge Village. Mrs. William Burnett is very sick at home. Her friends are apprehensive of pneumonia. Uh, Mrs. Edith ha Precious and Bertha Collins visited Mr. and Mrs. Wilfred Normington of Worcester for, for a few days last week. W.E. Parsons is putting in the stone foundation for W.W. W. Johnson's new ice house at uh, Burgess Pond. Uh, Walter Johnson had the ice concession at Burgess Pond. Graniteville is the next section. Miss Edith Normington, who served her connection with the office of C.G. Sergeant and Sons, I'm sorry, who severed her connection with the office of C.G. Sergeant and Sons last Saturday, was pleasantly remembered by the office staff when she was presented an elegant traveling bag. The help in the machine shop also presented her a purse of money. Miss Normington has made many friends during her stay here, and her departure is to be regretted. The Graniteville readers of the wardsmen miss greatly the writings of Mrs. Grace E. Lawrence of Littleton that have not appeared over the familiar L of late. Mrs. Lawrence always has the pleasing faculty of writing interestingly on every subject and has the firm conviction of her own ideas and is not afraid to speak her mind for the public good. It is hoped that Mrs. Lawrence may soon find it convenient to arrange her personal affairs so as to continue her writing, for we miss her clever work very much. We'll read a little later, I believe, that Mrs. Lawrence was the victim of a house fire which was reported in the Littleton section of last week's newspaper. Many people from this village attended the entertainment and dance at the Mission House last Saturday evening and report a very enjoyable time. The serious fire in Littleton Common some two weeks ago that threatened to wipe out the entire village and by which Fred O. Stiles and Mrs. Grace E. Lawrence lost their fine sets of buildings, cast a gloom over that community, and the blackened ruins were a sad sight to behold. However, this is soon to change, for although Mr. Stiles has encountered more than his share of bad luck, his courage is still good, and plans are now underway for the erection of a fine new private residence and a set of buildings in keeping with his increasing business. He has bought 60 feet additional frontage from Mrs. Lawrence, and this, with the lot where the hotel formerly stood, will make a fine building site. The batters are up, and the cellar is now being dug for the new building, which, when completed, will cost in the neighborhood of $10,000. The well-known contractors of Littleton, Needham and Fletcher, have the contract to build the house. The fourth night fortnightly club of North Westford held a largely attended meeting in the district school building. Uh, they used the uh, right, it's, uh, it was a, one of the 10 district schools on Groton Road. It was sometimes referred to as the Wright School and at other times the Lions School. 
and they met last week, Friday night. This meeting had been looked forward to with no little interest owing to the red-hot debate that was scheduled to take place, and people came from far and near to listen to the argument. The president, Fred R. Blodgett, called the meeting to order at 8.15 o'clock, after which the following pleasing program was given. Opening prayer, Reverend Samuel H. Armand, he was the... Um, who was currently serving the Methodist Church, Methodist Episcopal Church in Graniteville. Reading by Mrs. William Wyman. Selection by the orchestra, Wilford G. Blodgett, cornet. Oscar A. Nelson, clarinet. Arthur Blodgett, violin. Miss Della Blodgett, piano. Recitation, Horace E. Gould, debate. Resolved that a liberal education is worth more to a young man of 21 as a starter in business than the money it could cost to get the education. Speaking for the affirmative, Samuel L. Taylor and Jotham Everett Woods. And for the negative, Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher and Horace E. Gould. Each speaker on the debate had his own time to put forth his arguments, after which the question was opened to the House, during which Reverend Armand, Hiram Dane, and Joe Wall took part. Those on the affirmative side spoke finally from an educational standpoint, but wandered somewhat from the question in dispute. The negative side spoke less but said more, the arguments of Mr. Fletcher being practical and instructive from start to finish. After all who wished had had their say, the president of the club allowed the audience to vote with the following results. On the merit of the discussion, affirmative 5, negative 18. On the merits of the question, affirmative 11 and negative 18. The orchestra was then heard in several pleasing selections, after which the meeting adjourned to meet again in two weeks. The affair on Friday night was one of the most interesting that has been given by the club for some time, and the members are to be congratulated on the fine showing made. Now that's the news in Westford for the week ending November 14th, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.